Good to see you this morning. Bless you. Have, trust you've had a good week. Have you had a good week, everybody? Yeah. yeah, good week. Awesome. Good to hear. Well, again, if you are watching online, we're just glad you're here with us. Welcome. And uh, just a couple of little housekeeping notes. I want to just tell you, next Sunday, June 7th, this service, 1130, and only the 1130 service, we're going to be having what... Uh, we're going to be opening up our nursery for the zero to five-year-olds. So next Sunday, 1130 service, open up the nursery <coughs> over here to the zero to five-year-olds. Not the kids, not six to 12 yet, just zero to five. We're going to do that for a little while and see how it goes and then continue to open up gradually as we go along. So I encourage you to, if you have children uh, that age, come, be a part, we'd love to have you. As well, if you have older kids, some of you are here as well and the kids, and they, Brother Don and Pastor Don and his wife, Brennan, to give us all the kids have coloring books and things like that and have a good time even while they're here. So they haven't handed me one of those yet. I'm looking forward to getting one before I go home today. But uh, that's good for the kids. Also, June 14th, we want to also let you know, which is two weeks from today, from 1 o'clock to 3.30, we're going to have an open house at our new building. Open house at our new building. Yeah, right down the road. I don't know about you, but I love open houses. You know, I, I, love, I love going to those old open houses things, and, and I love going to places that I can never afford, I can never live in, uh, and just like dream, you know, and, and see what the other people live like. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about? And, and, and so we're going to have an open house, and for you just to come and walk in and, um, and just enjoy what uh, has been happening and going on inside that building and we're really pushing hard to get that thing done quickly and so we can enjoy it together as a family uh, continue to pray with us thank you for your giving towards that but uh, this week coming up uh, we got our permit last year uh, last week excuse me to uh, lay the foundation to uh, go ahead and pour that on the north side of the building you can show a picture if you want and uh, there uh, we showed it I think one of those pictures last week but finally got the permit this week We'll be pouring tomorrow, and then in three weeks, the fabrication will be done, and we can put the metal up, and uh, we'll extend that. And that area right there that you're looking at literally will be the platform area of the new building. That's basically, we're going to take this, and it becomes that, which is like huge. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be a lot of fun, uh, being able to move around and not bump into one another, and just enjoy God's goodness over our lives. So thank you again for being a part of that. And again, the journey class next uh, Sunday as well. Uh, if you're new here, uh, we just love to have you kind of connect with us. And it's kind of our on-ramp to getting involved here at Summit. We'd love to have you be involved with us. And so that'll be at four o'clock next Sunday. Well, I don't know if you heard about The Bachelor and he loved cats. He was a cat lover. He had a favorite cat. And, and uh, he was invited by friends to go to Europe and have a and, and do a little tour, and, but he was reluctant because he loved his cat so much and didn't have any where for his cat to go. Finally, he reluctantly gave his brother his cat to take care of while he was gone. His brother wasn't necessarily a lover of animals, so he was a little concerned. But anyway, he, 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 he decided to let his brother take care of his cat. He went to Europe. As soon as he landed, got checked into the hotel. First thing he did was he made a phone call, called his brother. Hey, man, we made it. We're safe. We're good. How's my cat? His brother said, your cat's dead. My cat's dead. Oh, my. And he fell apart. Just had a collapse right there He's about this cat. He loved his cat so much. And then he kind of just took a moment and breathed. and goes, you know what? That was really mean the way you just told me, you know. That was just really cruel. He goes, well, what do you want me to say? Your cat's dead. He goes, well, you can let, like, gradually let me in on it, you know. Like he said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you could have said something like, you know, oh, I'm sorry, man, but your cat got out of the house. And he's on top of the roof and the fire truck's here to... To, to try to get him down, and then I would have called you the next day, how's, what, how's my cat, and I, you would have told me the fireman broke his back on the way down the ladder, and, and then the third day, I would call you, and you'd say, man, we took him to the surgeon, he did everything he could, but they couldn't survive, the, just the cat's gone, and, and just let me down gradually instead of just, your cat's dead. He goes, well, I'm sorry, dude, you know, but your cat was dead. He goes, all right, but okay, just understand. He goes, all right, all right. So he took a deep breath and finally said to his brother, he says, well, listen, that's out of the way. How's mom doing? 
He said, well, she's on top of the roof, and the firemen are up there looking for her now. Come on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. Do you ever remember um, a time or season in your life, maybe you're there right now, where you faced a little resistance in your life? Uh, maybe it looked something like a, uh, you're at a board meeting, you're making a presentation, you prepared for quite a long time for this presentation, and you're making this presentation, and people are like, oh, you can tell they're on board, they're with you, they're behind you, they're seeing it, they're getting the vision that you're presenting to them, except there's one guy over in the corner with his arms crossed, and he's just staring at you with his real mean face, and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, and you could tell he's not buying it, and, and he, he's totally a stonewall in you, or maybe it's a, you're a school teacher, and You've got this incredible class, and a couple weeks into the school season, you realize there's a wonderful class, except there's one student that if you could just, like, kick him out, you have a great class, but there's this one, one kid, or maybe you moved into a new neighborhood, and you're just having a wonderful time, and you join your new community of friends, except you've, you've got this one neighbor that just seems to be the thorn in your side. Or maybe you um, found this job and it is the job of your dreams. You're qualified for it. You meet all the conditions. You got everything that this job is calling for, except for when you fill out that application, it says, have you ever committed a felony? And your heart just drops to the floor and you realize, man, I don't think I may be able to get this job. How many know what I'm talking about? You you faced these kind of walls before. Maybe, hey, maybe you, you've been in a relationship in the past and You've moved on and trying to get move further in your life, but that old relationship keeps coming up and somehow biting you in the in the feet or the toes, the heel, or whatever, and just saying, "Hey, <laughs> come on now, this is church." And 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 you're like, "Man, will when will I ever be free from that situation that I?" once was involved in. Can I just talk this morning for a few minutes about the word resistance? Everybody say resistance. What do you do in seasons of resistance? What do you do when you're in the season where things are coming at you, coming against you, uh, moving towards you, and it's, res and it's causing you to not be able to push forward in the dream that God has given you, in the passion that you have, in, the, in that desire or that vision that you feel uh, you need to fulfill, that God has laid in your heart, that, that you feel is your purpose and your gift in life. And what do you do in these seasons? I remember when we first moved here, my family years ago, we're from the Midwest, and in the Midwest, you don't have hurricanes. You have things called tornadoes. And the good thing about a tornado is that you only have a few seconds to prepare. And so you don't have to worry about it very long. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's not like a hurricane. You got weeks, you know, or days to, 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 to look at this thing coming your way. You, just, you got a couple seconds and it's, and it's gone or killed you. One of the two. You know what I'm saying? You're one of the two. You're one of the same. You make it. But a hurricane, come on, it's, it's fierce winds and it wreaks havoc but, and you see it coming. So, so anyway, we weren't used to a hurricane. We weren't here very long. And, and sure enough, there's a hurricane out in the Gulf heading somewhat our way. Now, we, we didn't know if it's our way or th that way. Or this, anyway, we're, we're like, what do we do? What do we do? And so we started looking around as it's getting closer, and we see people, you know, putting plywood up on their windows, and we see some people, you know, uh, pile, you know packing up their cars and heading out of town, and, and, we're, and we're starting to get a little anxious. And it's, a, it's about a, a day or two out now in the Gulf, and, and so we're like, man, what, what in the world do we do? What do we do? And so we had uh, some friends, and we went over to their house, took our kids, went over to their house, and the winds are already starting to blow. And you can tell, man, and, and, and some of the palms, you know, kind of laying down a little bit. I'm like, wow, this is a pretty tough wind already, and we haven't even got to. And so we're asking, what are y'all going to do? And they're like, well, we don't, we don't know. We're just going to sit and watch the weather and, and, and make it, hopefully make a decision. And Can we sit and watch? Okay, 
yeah. So we all were sitting in the living room, Lisa, uh, Melissa and I and those two, the couple, we're watching the news. And we're like doing this, you know, and like going like this. And I'm going like this. What in the world do we do, you know? Do we stay? Do we go? Do we stay? Where do you go? You got the projection going that way. And you got a diagram going that way. And you got this one line going right towards us. You know how many know what I'm talking about? Anybody hurricane people, seasoned veterans here in the house this morning? Come on. And so we're looking, what do we do? What do we do? And, and uh, about that time, we hear this, woo, outside. And I'm like, that, that noise is familiar. That sounds like my kid. And uh, so I go outside, and just in time to see my son on a skateboard with an umbrella flying <laughs> down the street. Woo! He's taking advantage of this situation. I'm like, what in the world? And it's such a contrast. You know, we got, we got resistance coming. I'm inside fretting and worrying and getting all anxious. And my son and my kids are out there flying around. They, they were loving life. You got some people packing up their stuff, and I get it. And you got others out there surfing in the waves going, whoa, this is the greatest waves that we ever had. Two different approaches to resistance. How do you handle resistance? What does it look like in your life? I want to talk to you this morning about resistance. A quote by Stephen Pressfield. He says, many of us have two lives. The life we live and the unlived life within us. And between these two lives stands resistance. Hmm. Resistance. Let's understand resistance. Let's talk about it for just a few minutes. Resistance. Number one, here's what I need you to understand about resistance. Resistance is inevitable. You will have resistance in your life because whenever you choose to pursue anything worthwhile, you're going to get resistance. I was talking with a young man today that came second service, first time visitor. Three kids with him. He actually popped in to the... Uh, service about this time, about an hour or so ago, and sat down in the very back. He said, I was determined to come to church. He said, I haven't been to a church in a year. He says, kind of fell out from God a little bit, and, but I was, I, was, I was determined to come. But then you know, this came up, and then that came up, and this came up, and even though I told my kids we're going to church, this came up, and so I was heading down to Orange Beach to get to do a job, have my kids in my car, heading down the beach express. My son turned me and goes, "Dad, are we not going to go to church like you said?" He said that pierced me in the side, in the heart. He says I made a U-turn on that beach express, and we came in just in time to hear the very message that was happening to me in the process. My goodness. He came out, he said he had goosebumps all over his arms. We live in a very real world and resistance happens. And you will make the best promises and the best, uh, best of your ability to keep those promises. And sometimes you come against stuff and you wonder what in the world's going on. Can I tell you? It's called resistance. Mm. It's inevitable. It will happen. And most of the time it comes at the most inopportune times of your life. The time when you don't want, the, 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 this is the time of all times I don't need resistance. I just need, come on kids, I need you all to get in line and we're going to Disney World and be quiet. Don't resist, don't yell, don't gripe, don't fuss, don't hit one another, don't kick each other. Come on, how many have been on any trips on vacation with kids like that? And uh, anybody, it's going to come. I was, remember I was taking a, a trip. I mean, I, I was 16 years old. Just got my driver's license. I was going to take my first date out of town. I lived in a little small farming community, just a couple thousand people in the town. And uh, so I was going to go to 40 miles away, take my date to Quincy, Illinois, which is right on the Mississippi River. It has, there's, there's islands in the Mississippi River, and there's this little island called Quincippi Island. Out, out, and they, had a, they built a little like um, ski lift type of thing, a little lift over there to the island. And they had a little zoo and things like that, and little 
amusement park that they had built, and just a fun place to go for a first car date, you know, out of town, and I couldn't wait to go, and I had planned this all out, had the map, because in those days, you didn't have GPS, you just had maps. How many remember old maps? You know, can you fold them up, you can never fold them back. They all messed up after you unfold them the first time, and so I had my little map, got it all in my head, memorized where I was supposed to go. We Now, in my hometown, where I'm from, we only had two red lights, flashing red lights. It wasn't even a real red light. It was just a flashing red light, not a green, not a yellow. I didn't know lights had green and yellow. We just thought they were all red and they flashed. And, and we sometimes were so bored, we'd just go up in the corner and just watch the light just flash back and forth. It's like, wow, that's, that's amazing, you know. That's how boring it was in my hometown. So anyway, we got up to Quincy, Illinois, and I'm driving, and I'm a little feeling a little under pressure because, you know, you know, a little first time date and, you know, trying to make an impression, you know how it is, and, and uh, trying to remember at the same time, you know, everything about driving and then at the same time where I'm going. And so I get down in the middle of town, I little turned around, and, but I don't want to say that to her. I don't want to let her know that I'm clueless where I'm at. And I make a left turn on this particular street. And as I'm coming up the street, there's a car coming up over the horizon right in my lane. And it starts honking his horn and then swerves around me. And then I could tell, I look at the driver, I'm like, you know, like, what is up with you? And he's like, he's like speaking to me in another foreign language. Come on, somebody. And giving me all sorts of Hawaiian hand signals and things like that. And I'm like, what in the world? These people are crazy in these big cities. It was, it's the city wasn't all that big. It was bigger than my hometown. And so I drive a little further. And there's another car coming my way. And I dodge that car. I'm like, what's going on? And this girl, she, she says, she yells, you're in a one-way street, you dummy. I was on the wrong, I was going the wrong way on a one-way street. Sometimes resistance is inevitable. <laughs> And it comes at the wrong time. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And number two, what I realized about, well, let me just say this about resistance. Just let me define it for a second. In the Webster's Dictionary, it means a fixed body which interrupts or something that stops or repels or defeats progress that is being made. Resistance. The, the French formed a thing, an organization called the Resistance in World War II to do an underground form of, you know, uh, uh, resistance against Germany as they had invaded them. And what resistance really is, it's a, a force that tries to push us back whenever we start to make headway towards our goals or our God-given goals or our God-given dreams. And the harder we try, it seems like the more resistance we feel. And it will come. I don't know if you're in resistance right now, if there's something going on pushing against you. But I will tell you this, if you're not in that place right now, it's coming. And if maybe you're not in it right now, but you just came out of it. And let me just also say that if you're following after the Lord's dreams and pursuits and goals that he has for your life, it's just a matter of time before you face resistance. Now, people that don't want resistance and don't like resistance usually are people that don't ever accomplish anything and gain any ground for the kingdom of God. As one person says, he said, any dead fish can swim downstream, but it takes a live fish to swim upstream. Come on, somebody. Is there any hope? Is there any life? Is there any dreams? Is there any hopes inside of you? If there is, then you're going to be a person that has to become familiar from time to time in these seasons of resistance. It's inevitable. Number two, resistance comes in various forms. First form of resistance usually comes through people, unfortunately. Sometimes even people that are near us. Let me just make a warning here, warning, caution. Be careful sharing God-sized dreams and the people you share them with. You can't share your God-sized dreams with everybody at once. There are just really, if it's a God-sized dream, it's usually just a handful of people even at that that you can really share the dream with to begin with. Why? Because many people don't want you to break out of the box. They don't want you to think out of the ordinary. They don't want you to think 
in a godly way. They don't want you to think in a faith-filled way. They don't want you to pursue something that's different than their living. They want you to be as miserable as they are. Come on, somebody. They want you to be as unhappy as they are. They want you to be, they don't want you to get out of the rut that you're in. So, so they'll, they'll come against you. Even if they, inside they want you to succeed, they would never let you tell, they would never tell you that. I remember um, when I was in, in high school, I, after I graduated, I decided, I made this decision that for my first year out of high school, I would tithe if you would, a year of my life to the Lord. I don't know where I really got that idea. I just felt it was a good idea that I took a year of my life and just gave it to God. And after doing that, then maybe God, you know, I would move on with, you know, whatever God had for me. And so I said, well, I'll just go to a Bible college and just kind of get a foundation of the Word of God and just some good principles that will carry me on throughout my life and just got to get a good spiritual foundation before I pursue my other collegiate re- recruits, uh, pursuits. And so that was my plan. So, so I was pretty excited about it. Didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I knew one year of my life, that's what I was going to do. So my grandparents, I love my grandparents and my great-grandparents. Um, they passed away since then, but um, they, they, we were together and, and um, it was... After I graduated, they said, well, son, what's your plans now? So I said, well, here's the plans. I, I just want to let you know that, well, I'm going to go to Bible college for a year. And now you have to understand, in that season of life, um, they, they had become very poisoned by uh, televangelists and things like that that had gone bad and gone sour. And they basically had a real attitude toward any preacher, period, you know, and so I said, I'm going to go to Bible school for a year and just get a good foundation, and he said, my grandpa said, "Um, is that like where they, where preachers go, and I said, well, you know, some people go there to become preachers, I don't think that's what I'm going to do, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, they go to be preachers there, and uh, he said, well, I think that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say, I said, well, um, well, Gramps, why would you say that? Because them preachers, all they want is your money. And uh, they, they want your money, and they, they, they don't care, you know, nothing about you. They just want money, money, money. And uh, I think, you, you know, I think you're going there and making a mistake. I said, well, Gramps, I, 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 I'm sorry you hear that, but I, that's what I'm going to do. And they said, well, are you have enough money to, to live off and to do that, to go there? I said, well, not really. And then he said this. My grandpa said, well, don't ask us for any money. And my great-grandfather was sitting over there, and he's like this, and he's like, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And these are two people I really respect. I still respect, you know, I didn't diminish my respect for them in that area, but, I, but in that area, yes. I, and so, anyway, as you know now, I'm a preacher, and uh, <laughs> I'm a pastor, and all the look, God kind of worked all that out. But I had the wonderful opportunity, come on somebody, before they pass away, to be pastor in the church and for them to be sitting in the church. Come on now, come on. How many know God is good? Yeah, God's good. And, and not only did, did I have that opportunity, but, but I was so tempted to just like say, I don't, now I want to pass the offering plate to that couple right there, right there. You know, they want to give really big right now. I didn't do that, but you always have those temptations, but. I, I do believe that Satan um, uh, resistance comes in various forms, and, and, and many times it's even through people, even some people that you really love in some areas. Listen, let me give you an example. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, we see Satan using, Satan the devil himself, using a very uh, a good person even to challenge even the dream of Jesus. Jesus, in Matthew 16, in about 15, is sharing with his disciples, and he's asking them for a little feedback, getting a little poll, if you would, of how things are going out there and what people are saying, even about him. And they said, well, people are saying you're Isaiah, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, 
all this kind of stuff. There's all sorts of stuff going around on social media, Jesus, about you. Instagram saw just the other day. Facebook said Jesus, Jesus is Isaiah. I was crazy. I'm just kidding you. But, but and, and, and Jesus said, well, that's interesting, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Who, who, I want to know what you think. And Peter steps up to the plate and goes, well, I'll tell you who you are. In my opinion, the way I see it, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And Jesus was like, that a boy, Peter. And let me just tell you something, Peter. You didn't get that revelation on your own. God himself gave you that revelation. You're hearing from God. You are sensing the presence of God. And you're getting revelations from God himself. Here's a blue ribbon. Here, hang it on your chest. Be proud, Peter. Way to go. Six verses later, Jesus goes, hey, guys, here's the deal, boys. We're, we're going to go to Jerusalem. And the, the chief priests and the elders and them guys, they're not going to like me. And they're not going to like what I'm saying. And here's what's going to happen. They're going to arrest me, and they're going to kill me, and they're going to put me in the grave. And Peter stood up, and he's like, oh, no, no, no. That's not happening. Over my dead body, they're going to arrest you. Oh, no one's going to do that. My Jesus, you're my Messiah. You're my man. You're my dude. Come on, you're my, I'm your posse. Come on. So he do it. And Jesus, go, and Jesus, this is the guy, six verses later, had this revelation from God. Jesus turns to him and says, he says, skit behind me, Satan. I can't imagine being Peter. You got the blue ribbon, you know. You got the revelation. You got the scholar's cap. You come cum laude. Come on, of biblical scholars of Greek and Hebrew. And, and suddenly Jesus calls you Satan. The Messiah calls you Satan. Get behind me. What does that tell me? There's a lot of things that that says. But one of the things it says is even good God-fearing people sometimes can say things that have not come from God. And that was what Jesus discovered concerning his future, concerning his dream of redeeming mankind. Sometimes people resist the God-sized dream in your heart. Number two, sometimes circumstances resist the God-sized dream of your heart. Financial resistance, hard times, Things aren't coming together. Things aren't, the, everything, you had this dream, you stepped out in faith, you believed it was from the Lord, and now everything seems like it's falling apart. Money's tight. Maybe you're physically, health, your health is coming under some kind of uh, oppression. Social circumstances, personal circumstances, political circumstances, all sorts of circumstances can come into play and pop up right at the time that you're stepping out to do something great for the Lord and causes resistance in your life. Resistance is inevitable and it comes at strange times. I want you to say, and say this, number three this is our last point today. Resistance is normal. Just because you're experiencing resistance doesn't mean you're a weirdo. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Because many times our first thought, whenever we experience resistance, is we think, oh my goodness, I must be doing something wrong. God's not pleased with me. God's not happy with me. I miss God somehow. I must have sin in my life. I deserve this. I deserve, my life deserves to fall apart. Just this is happening right now. But I can, I'm here to tell you that some, many times resistance is not because you've done something wrong. It's simply nothing but proof that you're going in the right direction. Now, yes, yes, you need to take a moment. You need to reflect. You need to you take an examination. You need to say, God, is there anything you're saying to me? Am I, do I need to make a correction? Do I need to, you know, change some things, there's something in my heart that's wrong. To, yes, you need to, but after you move past that and you've kind of made sure you've examined your heart and you're still experiencing this resistance, you need, you need to understand it is not of God, it is of, some, of another place. And it's absolutely normal because there's evil in the world. Evil really exists. And we have an enemy against us. 
And whenever you as a child of God step out of faith to do something great for God, I'm going to take a, a meal over to our neighbor and I'm going to just tell him, uh, you know, Jesus loves them. Well, you know what? The casserole is going to burn. You know, the dog's going to bite your heel. Come on in and, and you're going to, you know, get a headache. Anytime you do any great thing for God, is anybody in this room, say, say, can someone say amen this morning? Amen. Come on, give me some help this morning. Come on. I'm here to tell you that resistance is a part of life. And it happens to good people that are doing good things that we need to be prepared for. Look at this. David. Before we talk about David, look at this. this 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be alert, be sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around. Come on, like a little pussycat. Oh, we, we got one person reading this. The, the, the devil himself, he prowls around like a what? Like a roaring lion. What is he doing? He's looking for someone to devour. He's looking for a dream to devour. He's looking for a purpose to devour. He's looking for hope to devour. He's looking for love and generosity and kindness to devour. He's, he's looking for something that he can put his teeth in and to annihilate it and to do away with it. He prowls around looking for you. Oh, you got a bullet on your back. I don't know if you know that or not. Well, not a bullet, but bullet. Bullseye, come on, somebody. <laughs> if you have a bullet in your back, that may happen too. I don't know. It could happen too. I want to look at this guy named David. David, before he ever met Goliath, had already been anointed by God. Now, we're all familiar with David and Goliath and that whole story and everything. And we're like, oh, isn't that a cute little story? This little boy goes up against a giant. Oh, he slays him. Oh, everybody's happy. And then, yeah, yeah, well, that, that was a cool little story. But, but there's a lot to go into that story. There was a prophet named Samuel, the great prophet of the Lord at that time. And he's told by God to go to this house to anoint the next king, the next king. This is important to realize. Of Israel. And so he goes and he finds David and he anoints him to be the next king. Now, Pastor Kemp and I have been doing a series on Wednesday night. And I asked Pastor Kemp, who's seasoned in the Lord, I love this man, and I'm, and I'm not going to tell you how many years he's been in ministry, but it's been a couple. And, but he knows a lot about the Lord and the kingdom of God. And so I asked him this question last Wednesday night on our Facebook Live at 6.30 that you can join us with. A little innocent plug there. 6.30 Facebook Live. I said, what is the biggest lesson you've learned and what's been the biggest blessing to you that you've learned about the kingdom of God, about God in your walk with the Lord? And he said this one truth. And he said it's the truth of the authority of the believer or the authority that we have in Christ or the sonship of the believer. The, the authority that we, that we receive from the Lord when we become a Christian. The word Christ means the anointed one. The word Christian means someone who follows Christ who is also anointed. You are anointed. Turn to your neighbor and tell them this morning, you are anointed. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may not think they're anointed, but they are. The, even though they wake up with bad breath in the morning, they're still anointed. Come on, somebody. Even though their feet stink, come on, and, and their, you know, their hair grows out of their ears, you know, they're still anointed. Come on. Anointing has no, uh, it has no, no, no preference. It's just looking for a person that's willing to humble themselves before the Lord. So Samuel comes, finds this little boy, David, a shepherd out in the field, and he anoints him. When he anoints him, what he says, it basically does, is he pours oil symbolic of the authority of the kingdom of that nation and the th authority of God upon him. And so David's walking back out to the field and his hair's all wet from this oil that's been poured on him by the prophet, but he's different this day than he was the day before because now he's received the authority of God upon his life. The authority in the natural even to be a king. Even God has given all of us He's called us all to be kings and priests and prophets in the world today. 
And when I say a king, I go, ah, I could never be a king. What? That's crazy. We don't even have kings. Well, I'm talking about a spiritual king, a king like in the marketplace, a person that declares things to be done and things happen where the favor of God operates through their life. They, they speak with authority and things begin to take place. God has given you that authority. And so David is now, now anointed to be king and has authority in his life. So what does that mean to us? What does that mean to you and me? Well, here's what happens. Let's follow the story. So now Goliath has come to the nation of Israel. He's defying God. He's out, he's out in the field for 40 days. He goes back and forth saying, Bring, get, send me your best guy. Send me your best guy out here to fight me. And Israel, you know, they're cowering in fear. They're scared. They're anxious. They're stressed out. And no, no soldier wants to go fight this big, huge, nine-foot Goliath. And so he's out there just slandering the name of God, just cursing the name of God. Now, everyone else is there. Saul the king is there. The soldiers are there. Some of the best fighters of Israel are there. Big trained warriors of Israel are there. But no one has anything inside of them that wants to deal with this giant until David shows up on the scene, a little kid, a little nobody. I'm not talking about some troublemaker that drives up on his motorcycle and is looking for a fight. I'm just talking about an innocent little Christian kid that shows up to the scene where God's name is being mocked. But the difference between David and everybody else that's sitting here watching this whole thing play out is they're just people. But David is, yes, a person, but he's an anointed person. He's been given the authority of God upon his life. He's been given something, an unction, is something inside of him that is bigger than just himself. It's, he understands that God is with him. Because when you understand you're anointed, you walk around going and singing songs like, God is with me, God is for me, he's not against me, his peace is upon me. You understand that, you live that, you talk that, you, every perspective, every decision comes from that concept that God is with me. And you understand that you move and you walk and you have your being in Christ and everything operates out of this position of authority that you're with and in Christ. And so he walks upon the scene and goes, huh, what's going on? And he, 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 he looks out there and he, he sees everybody in their, in their little, uh, what do they call it, you know, when you're hiding, you know, when you're in your, your, the trench, thank you. Man, what would I do without you guys? You are awesome. You are awesome. So he's in, they're all in their trenches, you know, they're looking out over, you know, the, the bank of the trench, and they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, he's out there again, he's out there, and David's like, what's going on? And he hears the curse and the vile and the language and, you know, all this stuff going on, and David says to his brother, because he was going there, sent by his dad to bring his brothers some lunch and din dinner and bread and things like that, some food, because they've been out there for 40 days. And to give his dad a report of what's going on. And so he, and he finds his brother, but he sees this going on. And he says to his brothers, he you know, probably drops his bread, the bread, and he's like, what? And he says, what's going on? And isn't anyone going to do something here? And, and, the, and the Bible says that Eliab, his older brother, says to, heard him speaking and burns with anger against David. And says, why have you even come down here? You little idiot. Well, who's back there watching the sheep? Who's watching that you, you should be back there watching? You probably just left and didn't even bother to find a replacement for you. Who's going to take your job in the little sheep field where you're supposed to be? You're not a, supposed to be up here with the big guys in the battlefield. You're supposed to be home taking care of the little lambs. He's just like, come on. And, and the Bible even says to him, I know why you're here because you're conceited, David. You're conceited and your heart is wicked. You only came down here to watch the battle because you're tired of being out out there in the field. We know you. Just what in the world's going on with you? Now, let me tell you something. When you are moving in the authority of God, you will meet resistance. And David found it first even in his own family, his brothers, his brothers, his oldest brother, the brother that you're supposed to want to grow up to be like, is like just nailing him. And mocking him and calling him conceited. He, his brother, is calling the next king conceited and wicked. Yet this is the man, this little boy is the tool, the vessel that God had chosen to redeem and, and, to, and to save all of them. 
And yet his own family members calling him wicked and conceited. I'm talking to somebody this morning. You've been trying to walk this thing out for the Lord, but you even have people close to you been calling you all sorts of names and challenging your very character and trying to drag you back and down in the muck and the mire that you came out of. You need to know, you know what you need to do? You need to do like David. And you know what David did? He did nothing. He just walked away. He's like, whatever. <laughs> Talk to the, come on. Word gets out to Saul, the king. There's this little upstart out there, you know, just uh, questioning everything going on. Saul says, bring this little guy to me. He brings him to Saul. Saul goes, oh, hey, I hear that you, like, want to go fight this guy or something. What, what's up with you? And so 1 Samuel 17, he said, let me just tell you something, Mr. Saul, Mr. King. Don't let anyone lose heart. Don't let anybody be discouraged. Don't anybody get needs to get depressed here, is what he's saying. Everyone needs to calm down and understand the answer is here. I'm here. You've been waiting for me. the warrior. Here he is, right here. I'll go fight him. And he says, you're not able to go fight that. This is the Saul. This is, this is his authority. So first of all, he's resisted by his peers or his family or his close friends. Now he's got this authority figure saying, what do you think you're doing? You can't go against Fahim. You're, you're only a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. So now you got your authority. People are supposed to know better. So people, supposed, people have gone before you. It's people that are in high positions saying and coming and challenging your dream, your heart dream, your God dream. And you can't do that. You're just a little kid. He's been fighting warriors. He's, he's got it. He's got a black belt. He's got a gold belt. He's got a green belt. He's got, he's got all the belts lined up in his bedroom. He's, been, he's put down. Everybody's come up against him. You are, who do you think you are? And so you got resistance that comes sometimes from over you. And then we find another kind of resistance. Saul says to him, well, I'll tell you what. I don't know. I'm just tired of being out here. Might as well do something done. Let's do something. Suit up in my armor. And so they say, hey, suit this little kid up with my armor. And he brings some armor. It's like, you know, extra large, you know. He's got this breastplate and his helmet, you know, the shield and sword and, you know, his feet and everything. And so you can just see David, like, you know, walking around like some, you know, some suit of armor, some knight, you know, that doesn't know what he's doing, tripping and everything. Finally, David gets up and takes off the helmet. He's like, I can't, I can't use this. This is crazy. I'm not, I don't know how to use this. This isn't my stuff. This isn't, I'm not used to this. I, I have a, I, I, here's my weapon. Here, here's my, see this little piece of leather right here? This is my, le this is my weapon. And everyone's like, are you kidding me? What in the world? Here's the third type of resistance you get. The third type of resistance is the type of systems and processes and tools that other people want to put on you to use. In other words, they say, well, listen, if you're going to fight, you're going to have to fight like this. If you're going to do it, you're going to have to do it my, the way I think you should do it. If you're going to go after it, you're going to have to do it the way you need to do it this way. You need to do it that, the way I would do it. Let, let me tell you something. Just because they have an idea doesn't mean that idea is from the Lord. Come on, somebody. You, sometimes you got to go out to battle with what God has equipped you with. And it may, you may think it's nothing. You may think it's inferior. You may, you may feel like compared to everybody else and what they got, it's nothing. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter even what kind of armor you have. All you have to have is the anointing, the authority of God upon your life. It don't matter. It don't matter if you don't even know how to throw a rock. I mean, the, the glass is right there. David could have thrown that rock that way, and I promise you, because the authority upon his life and the anointing upon his life, that rock would have gone still straight into his forehead. And so sometimes, what am I saying? I'm saying resistance comes, and worship team, come on ahead if you don't mind. Resistance comes through the form of friends and family. It can come through uh, authority figures as well, and it can even come through processes and systems and tools that are put upon your life that people think is the way to get things done. Talking about resistance, just want to, just kind of hovering over this topic of the series we've been in, it's not over. It's not over. Resistance comes, but it's not over. I'm a, I love baseball, I love all sports actually, but 
for those that love baseball, this is like the saddest time of your life right now because you can't watch baseball. Uh, but I was fascinated by a story I read years ago in the Sports Illustrated. It was about a young man, a true story, and he was a pitcher in baseball. And his father was a coach and knew a lot about baseball. And, and his father could tell he was very talented in his ability to throw a baseball. He threw all sorts of balls, curve balls, fast balls, knuckle balls. So he knew how to throw them all. He was very good at them. But one thing his father began to see as he, he was growing up is his son probably was not going to be very tall, which is probably... Um, an, that's, a, that's not good if you want to be a major league baseball player because typically the taller you are, the better you are, the harder you can throw, the more effective you can be. So his father realized if his son's ever going to be you know, a, a great ball player uh, on another level, then he probably has to, to change the way he throws the ball. So his father taught him a delivery, and I'm going to go a little baseball mechanics on you for a little bit. So if you don't like baseball, just bear with me. So typically a baseball player would do this, for his, we call it a wind-up, and then he would throw the ball. And that's kind of like the form. Well, his father said, son, what you're going to need is you're going to need to get closer to the plate before you release the ball because to make up for your short, shorter legs. And, um, and you're going to have to be able to throw with a little bit more authority because and more power for your fastball because to make up again for your lack of stature. So here's what we're going to do. And he taught him this wind-up and this delivery that when he got, he said, I want you to stretch your leg as far as you can. You know, further, when, further when, typically here, I want you to go further. And almost like where your knees touching the ground. In fact, I want you to go even further than that. <laughs> and he said, now, right when you're about to throw the ball, I want you to jump even a little bit closer to the home plate and then throw the ball. And it was like a really weird, unorthodox form of throwing the ball. But it turned out to be pretty effective. In fact, in all throughout high school, he, he was just firing that ball in and striking people out left and right, winning games, and started getting a lot of attention from colleges. Colleges began to send their scouts, and they would come, and they would sit down with their, his dad and said, we, our college is interested in your son Tim coming to uh, our college, and, and he go, okay, I just have one question. They said, what's that? Well, I just want to know, are you going to try to change his delivery? And every college said, well, uh, uh, Mr. Linsicum, we're going to have to absolutely do that because that's very unorthodox and no one really throws that. We see he has potential, but his potential has to be changed. He needs to sharpen a little bit. He needs to, he goes, well, then we're not interested. What do you mean, sir? Tim, Tim is a good, good player. What, what? He goes, no one's going to change his delivery. His delivery is good. And so one by one, they turned down big time schools. Finally, this little tiny school took a chance on him and promised, signed a little contract that they would not try to alter his delivery. And so he went to that school and continued to pitch the way his father taught him to pitch. Here again, striking people out left and right, left and right. He just blew through college as one of the great superstars of college pitching. Still not very tall, stature still inferior to major league ball players. And then finally, the draft came, and he was drafted high in the draft and onto a team that was, became a World Series pitching team, a World Series baseball winning team. And he was one of their starters. There's five starters, and he was one of them. All because his dad said, son, don't let anybody put any armor on you. It's not yours. You have a gift. You have a dream. You have a call. You have a purpose. You have a plan. The hand of God's upon. Now, this is not what he was saying, but this is what I'm saying. The hand of God's on your life. Now, just go with the anointing you have the authority you have, press through the resistance and watch God do something marvelous in your life. Amen, church? Come on. You believe that? 
All right, so we're ready. We can say one big amen. I am ready for resistance. How many can say that? Amen. Raise your hand. I'm ready for resistance. How many are bold enough to say resistance? Bring it on. Come on. That's the test right there, right? Bring it on, baby. That's what David did. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is, Mr. G. G. Goalio. Don't matter to me, sir. You're going down. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes for just a second with me this morning. You're here and you say, Pastor, I can definitely identify what you're talking about this morning. I have been in that situation where I really feel like I have come against resistance. And I just kind of sense that there's a something inside of me that just wants to press through. I, I just, that was for me. I need to press through. I need to hold on. I need to take back that dream that God has given me, that vision that God has placed in my heart. I'm not going to let it go. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to say a blanket prayer for, for you, all of you. But you would say, man, I can identify with that. Would, right where you at, would you just raise your hand and say, man, I, I need some I need some prayer. I, I, I need to face some resistance. Yeah, man, I just need to kind of go through it. I need to make my way through it, man, a little bit better. Yeah. So, Father God, you see our hearts. You see our hands. You see our desires. And we just ask right now, Lord God, for the strength, Lord, to continue to press through the resistance. We thank you for the hand of God upon our life. We thank you that you're moving through us. We thank you that you have plans for us. And Lord, we're not going to step back. In fact, in this time where the enemy has raised up a flood, we're going to become that standard against the enemy. And we're going to watch the anointing flow out of our life. And we're going to see miracles take place. We're going to see signs and wonders. We're going to watch a, a display of God's glory take place around us. And we thank you, Lord God, for giving us the courage and the boldness and the strength and the tools to move forward, Lord God, and engage in this hour that you've given us. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Can we give God some praise this morning? Come on, church. Come on. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for that, Lord. 